cloud. So you'll all know that that's going on now. Um, and you can, um, you can put your questions in the chat for, for people who are on Zoom. And I'm gonna see, hopefully I'm, I've pushed the go live to Facebook button as well. So we're gonna see, uh, sometimes it takes about a 30 second lag to actually get that going. Oh, it's gone back to, you do not have permission to live stream, Claire. Oh, okay. So um, well, well, we'll record from Zoom. So we okay. don't want to hold. We'll we don't want to hold this. We don't want to hold this up. Okay. Once we get going, I'll go to our Facebook page and I'll post a note there to tell them that we've had technical difficulties and we will post it uh, to them later. Um, so for now, we are recording. I have given the overview of best Zoom viewing practices. If anybody has a question for for Fauzia, I would encourage you to drop that into the chat on Zoom and I will make sure that she hears those uh, during the question and answer period. Um, and right now I would like to introduce Claire. Claire Johnson is the president of Mystery Writers of America in Northern California chapter. And she's going to tell you a little bit about us. I'm gonna go uh, dark and silent. And if any of you uh, need anything, like I say, I'll be monitoring the chat. So please just let me know um, if you need anything. Thanks very much. Take it away, uh, Claire. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I would like to uh, say thank you to Fazia for this presentation. I'm really looking forward to it. And I would like to stress about uh, what, you know, Mystery Writers of America does. We are the premier organization for writers, readers, fans, professionals who are interested in crime fiction. And I urge you, if you have not renewed your dues, please do so, so that we can continue to have events like this and host our website and, you know, blah, blah, blah. All this does cost. And so your dues do help us do outreach and provide events such as this. Uh, Fazio Burke has 25 years of experience in digital book publicity and marketing, giving her a unique and deep perspective on the value of what an author website can mean to the success of a book. She is the founder and president of SSB Associates. She has publicized books by best-selling authors such as Alan Alda, Ariana Huffington, and Deepak Chopra, as well as many first-time authors. She is the co-founder of PubSite, a platform for building author websites, which is used by Tom Clancy, Robin Cook, and hundreds more. Fazia also consults and offers a power hour for authors needing marketing advice. She is the author of online marketing for busy authors and is based in San Diego, California. Welcome, Fazia, and yeah. thanks for joining us today. Yeah. So please, please take it away. Okay, thank you, Claire. I so appreciate it. And hello, everyone. It's nice to be here with you. I would love it if you guys would use your reactions. Um, and let me know you're out there because honestly, it's the most bizarre thing, even though it's been now two years that we've been presenting on Zoom, um, to not get any kind of feedback. So I would appreciate anything you have to say in the reactions, make sure I'm um, staying on topic. Um, so as Claire said, uh, you know, I've had a lot of experience with authors and books and promoting them online. And as a publicist, which is my primary role, I really sort of realize what an impact a website has. And the thing is a lot of authors, I mean, you've heard that before. I mean, nothing new here, right? Obviously, you know, an author needs a website. But I think what I want to talk to you about is how to leverage it. Because I think what happens is a lot of people hire somebody, they set up a website, and then they never touch it again. So I always feel like it's, it's sort of like that brochure that is sitting at the, you know, in the corner of your office that's not being used. And that's really not the purpose of a website. So I want, I'm going to give you, I have a few slides, nothing major, um, just to give you sort of the macro level uh, information on the purpose of your website and how to leverage it. And then I can answer your questions because I feel like that's really where uh, a lot of the interaction and, and value comes from your own questions. And I'll certainly answer any questions that I had in my description. So let me just start with sharing my screen. 
So a lot of authors, uh, you know, they know that they need a website or sometimes actually they don't know that. So sometimes I've had authors who'll say to me, oh, you know, I have the Amazon page, I use that, or I have a Facebook page and I use that. And none of those are really what you need. You absolutely need your own website. In fact, some publishers, even, you know, the top publishers, Penguin Random House and such, uh, do a website, obviously, for every book, right? There's a one-page sheet on the book uh, information, and authors will say, well, that's the page I'm using. That's not really a great idea. You definitely need your own website. And if you do it in the right way, you will actually sell more books. It should be a real tool for you, not just something that is, a, as I said, a brochure sitting in a corner. It should be something that you work on regularly, right? If you do that, you'll find that the website is really delivering for you. Otherwise, a lot of authors will just say, oh, I don't even go to on my own website. <laughs> and that's the problem. So definitely, uh, you know, if you have the right website, you will sell more books for sure. So let's just go over the three macro level things that I want to talk about today. One is, I think it's really important that you build your website, not hire somebody to build it for you. I know there are a lot of do-it-yourself uh, platforms now. And you know, you find the one that works for you. Uh, I'm not a big fan of WordPress. It used to frustrate me to all ends, but nevertheless, whether it's Wix or Weebly or hopefully PubSite, which is a platform that we built just for authors, um, you do need to be able to build it. And the reason I'm saying that is because if you build it, you have a reason to actually use it and update it and make it work for you. And in fact, in you know, what I say to authors a lot of times is that you don't want a website that's a show pony. You need a website that's a workhorse, right? You want to put it to good use. If you have a website that's a one-page Wix site that looks pretty, but you're not actually updating it yourself, there's no new content, there's no reason to visit, there's no reason to be there. So building a website, learning that tool, you know, do it yourself is now the rage in everything. Whether we're in the supermarket and paying for our own groceries through our own, you know, kiosk or checking in. I recently checked into a hotel in a, on a kiosk. Uh, so do it yourself is the way to go. And I think that if you can find a platform that you really enjoy using, and really you can, uh, I really enjoy using PubSite. If you find the platform, and a lot of people enjoy Wix or you know Squarespace or Weebly, whatever it is, um, you will use it more. So build a site. Then the second thing that I want to tell you is that you have to give people a reason to visit. Whether it's the first time our visitors or if it's repeat visitors, you do need to give people reason. And I'll go over all of these in a little bit more detail. But just so you understand, that just having a website isn't easy, isn't, isn't really necessary if you're not going to do anything with it or you're not going to give anybody a reason to come and visit. So definitely have that in the back of your mind. And then the third thing is you really, this is sort of a marketing piece, you're, you're, you need to invite people to your website. So how do you do that? Like where are the people that you can invite to your website? So let's go over all of these in more details, but I just want you to think about it from a macro standpoint, you know, learning a platform and building the site yourself is really important now. And then keeping it updated. So you have, you're giving people reason to visit your website. And then the third thing is you've got to have places from where you can send people to your website. So let's go into more details on those things. All right, so as I said, the first thing you want to do is build a house for your website. And the reason I say that is because you know, a lot of times they're like these pretty websites that are not really doing what they need to do for the webs for the book and for you as a career, because it may look pretty, but it's not functioning. It's not getting people to your website. It's not organized well. All of those things are a really important thing. So when you pick a platform that you can use, and again, somebody can build it for you if you like, but please know how to update it. Because those days where you know you have to send something to a webmaster and they update the website and all of that are just long gone. So make sure you're picking a platform that you can use and that you can build and update yourself because that's going to be really important. 
So there, I think there should be four goals for your website. So when you are assessing your current websites, I want you to think about these four goals and how easy it is for you to accomplish them. So the first thing you want on your website is a place where people can learn more about you. Now there's a bio on Amazon, right? There's a bio on your author's website. I mean, your publisher's website. There might be a small short bio on Facebook and Twitter and all of these places. But there's only one place where you can really show who you are. You should have your story there. You should have photos. You should have something that connects people to you as a person and as with your history. So there isn't really any other place that you can really spend time telling your story. And so your website should really have that. And you should have a short bio, that's fine, maybe on the home page, but then it should lead to a more robust story about where you come from, who you are, why you're writing these books, all of those things that authors, I mean, readers really want to know. The second element is actually to have a mailing list. I believe, and I've spent a lot of time in book publishing, that your mailing list is your literally your most valuable asset when you are doing marketing for your book, because people will more likely buy a book from your mailing list than from social media. And social media is the sexy topic, right? Everybody talks about it. Everybody complains about it. It's the questions I get asked most. But make sure that you have a mailing list on your website, even if you don't plan to send anything out for a year. That's okay. Um, start building that mailing list. Start getting people onto that list so they can be aware of your work and what you're working on and when the book comes out and all of those kinds of things. So you want to make sure that on your website, it's very clear that they can sign up for a mailing list. Don't hide it somewhere. Don't make it difficult for people to get to your mailing list. Make sure it's easy to get to that. Third is, of course, you want people to buy your books, right? So having links to multiple booksellers is really important. Uh, a lot of authors will have a link just to Amazon. I'm not a big fan of that. Your publisher wouldn't be a big fan of that either. Um, you want, unless you're, of course, if you're publishing KDP or something like that. But if you're publishing uh, and you've got your book either, you know, through a traditional publisher or through Ingram Spark, you will be distributed through all the booksellers. And it's important to give our readers an option to buy the books from multiple booksellers. So definitely make that very easy. Have buy links right on the home page. Have buy links with the book. Don't make it hard for people to find the book, uh, how to find and buy the book. And then the fourth thing that you can think about, and a lot of authors don't think about this, is how can you monetize your website? What is the way that you can get people, once they're on your website, to actually engage with you in different ways? So for example, you know, people may not be ready to buy your books yet, but maybe they would be interested in a novella that you're selling on your website, or they can download um, you know, some, some some I have worksheets on my website that you can just get and it's not monetized because they're free but it gets people on my website people send people to my website for those worksheets so it's it helps people get on my site and then I do the power hour which I which Claire mentioned um, which is you know you can book me for an hour and then we can talk about marketing and just brainstorm ideas about book marketing so there's a way that you can do that for yourself too. So for example, mystery authors, you have to do a lot of research. I know that for you know many things. And so if you've done a very particular kind of research, you can offer that as a one hour, to, you know, and giving that information to someone else and maybe saving them some time in uh, doing that research. Or if you've done the research on finding an agent and you have examples of like how that worked for you, maybe that's something that people would buy for. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So just kind of keep that in mind is that, is there a way that you can monetize your expertise and your experience? For example, you know, your book was a huge success on Amazon. Your book, you know, is being released. Is there something that you have learned from that experience that you can now show to other people and they might be willing to pay for it. And of course, as you know, e-courses are all the rage everywhere. Everybody's you know, coming up with some way to show a, a course or lead people in a group. 
So those are kind of things that you can think about. And the only place you can bring all those four things together is on your website. There's no other place that you can bring all of that together where people can get to know you, sign up for your mailing list because they're interested in you, buy your books if that's, you know, if they've gotten to that point. And again, if you can monetize uh, your own experience and expertise in some way so people can do that. Uh, and, you know, uh, basically you have another way to leverage the website. Um, so those are the sort of the things that you want to think about is that on your website, did you cover those bases? You know, I think a lot of people talk about what should be on your website. And of course, we all know there should be book descriptions and things like that. But in my experience, I think the best use of your website is to make sure that these four things are covered. And of course, you need to have information on your books for sure. So the second point I wanna make before we get to questions is you've gotta give readers a reason to visit your website. And you know, when authors tell me, oh, I have no traffic to my website and I ask them when was the last time they updated their website and they say, I don't even remember, that's probably a good reason. You know, that you've given the readers no reason to come to your website. So if you're thinking you've gotten a website and you haven't touched it, that's not a good idea. Right? There's no reason to have a website if you're not going to touch it because neither will Google send you people, nor is there any reason to send people to your website. So you need to kind of refresh your content. And so let me talk about the four reasons I believe people come to a website and actually stay longer. Uh, one is to have unique content. Um, before I continue, just want to give me a thumbs up. I'm doing okay. I know I speak fast, so I just want to make sure I'm getting to your information or, okay, I don't see uh, that happening, but it's okay. I'm hoping I'm doing okay. <laughs> okay, so you've got to create unique content on your website. You do need to create something that cannot be found elsewhere. So if you're just going to replicate your, you know, the copy from your book, the bio from the book, you know, all of that, and there's no real reason to come to your website, then nobody will come. So you need to create something that is unique to your website, unique to, um, you know, to you and your content. You do need to update your website often. I know most authors don't really want to hear that because it's one more thing to do and, you know, it's, it's not easy to do and all of those kinds of things. But updating your website is a really important aspect. And you don't have to write a blog or something like that. You can change the graphics, you can add a photo, you can do whatever little change you can make. Add a, you know, you win an award or you get a review or you are on a podcast. All of those things are updating it often. You don't often all have to have like full on content for that reason. Now curated, this is a really important part that I think a lot of authors miss. So I've been to a lot of author websites that were created, let's say five, six, seven, ten years ago, and never really updated in terms of curating the content. So the content has been there since the beginning. And sort of the idea is that you show up at their website and it's on you as the visitor to navigate yourself through all of that content and figure out what's important and what's not important. And that's really not the role of your visitor, it's your role. Your role is to curate the content so they can get to what they need and what your goal is. Why are you inviting them to your website? What is it that you want them to do when they come to your website? So it's really important that you curate the content, get rid of old stuff. You know, if you have, con if you have blogs from seven years ago, nobody's reading that. Nobody's going to go through your website and read a blog from seven years ago. Update it post it again, you get new content, you get unique content and it's curated. So it's really, it's your role uh, when as the, basically as the inviter to your website to make sure that you've curated the content that people are not digging through decades old content to get to the information that's really important. And then the fourth thing again, is also easy navigation. A lot of websites can have that, you know, they have an easy navigation for sure but not all of them do. And one thing I would say is that there's a side, there's a sort of a balance between unique content and easy navigation. 
some of the websites that do have easy navigation, you know, the one page per axle sites that you can just kind of scroll through. Um, I don't know if that's really suited for authors because our job is words. People come to our website, they do want to read more. And a lot of those websites have very limited text. You know, they'll tell you, you need to put 22 words here and 16 words here and 18 words here. And that's, that, that might work for, you know, photo, uh, basically a photographer or a restaurant, but for authors, we need a website that actually allows for unique content all the time, right? Blog posts, maybe an essay, maybe a novella, maybe a short story, whatever it is that you wanna post, you want to make sure that you're posting it. The other thing that I wanna say here is that you also want a platform that will grow with you. So the idea is that you don't want a platform that you can design one website. I mean, you can design the website for one book, but then when you go to the next book or you go to a new blog post or something, the whole site has to be redesigned. And I've seen sites like that. So just kind of keep in mind that whatever platform you use, you want it to be something that can scale with you. So you don't have to reinvent the website. You don't have to redesign the website every time you have a new book. Um, that should be serve you as when you do a series, because obviously mystery authors do a lot of series. So you want to make sure that a website is growing with you as you're growing. So back to building a website, build a plat, uh, pick a platform that you can use and you can continue to use it um, and create the content that you want on. Okay, I think we're doing okay. I just want to get a quick question on WordPress and websites. Okay, so we will do that hopefully later. So let's look at the third big element that is really important in marketing your books and your website. And that's the reason to invite people to your website. And I've touched on this a little bit already, but I wanna give very specific ideas for you. So you know how you can invite people to your website. So one thing that I say, so somebody has their uh, audio on uh, and I can hear some paper rustling and stuff. Uh, hopefully it's not distracting other people, but if you can mute yourself, that would be great. Um, so I always tell authors that all roads should lead to your website. Your website really should be the hub of all your marketing in a way that everything you do, whether it's on social media or live event or publishing a book or whatever you're working on, the website is an integrated part of all of that whether you're doing interviews, you know, getting reviews for your books, all of those things, the website should really be important and all roads should lead to your website. Because there's this whole idea that um, there's a customer journey, right? And people don't just hear about a book once and then they go and buy it, that doesn't happen. Uh, people need to hear it multiple times and maybe, you know, your website is a critical part of that decision-making. Uh, whether they want your website or whether they want to buy your book or not. So you want to make sure that all of your activities lead back to your website. Your website is the hub of all of your marketing. That's really important. So let's just look at the ways that you can send people back to your website. So obviously, if you're on social media, I'm amazed at how many authors don't have link to their website, even in their bio. You know, it's some of these things are so simple, but it's almost like buttoning up all of the little pieces out there to make sure that everything you're doing is there a link to your website. Because if there isn't, you're missing that opportunity. You're missing an opportunity to connect with those readers, continue your relationship with them, all of those kinds of things. So I would say that make sure that your social media has links to your website, but also that when you post content on your website, on your social media, that there is a way to bring people back to your website. Of course, in Instagram, you can't do that, but you can in Facebook and you can in Twitter. So if you use or LinkedIn, uh, another place that you can bring people back to your website. So if you create new content, then you have something to say on social media about getting people to your website. And maybe you're creating content about, I don't know, Thanksgiving, right? Your, your mom's um, recipe for um, pumpkin pie, let's just say. It's, it's exquisite, that's amazing. You post that on your website, 
you post a link on social media to bring people to your website. Once they're on your website, at that point, and you can say in your recipe, you know, how that's connected to your book in some ways. So people can get interested in your books, they can get interested in your story, they can sign up for your mailing list. Those are the things you want to do. So the purpose of social media is not just creating engagement. Yes, it is. And you certainly want to do that and create activity. But really, one of the key reasons to be active on social media is to bring people back to your website. So they can engage with you in all of the other ways that we've talked about. So your goal on social media, at least one of them, is to bring people back to your website. So I want you to think about your social media strategy and say, how often is your strategy connected to bringing people back to your website? The second way that you can bring people back to your website is all obviously your email newsletters. Uh, whether you do them once every month, whether you do them once every three months, whether you do them once a year, you want to make sure that there is a reason for people to come to your website because there's new content, there's unique content, all of the things we talked about. And the newsletter then, they're literally one of the key roles that your newsletter is serving is to bring people back to your website. That is it. So when you're thinking about your newsletter, really think about, is it doing the job of bringing people back to your website? If it's not doing that job, then you need to change that a little bit. The other thing I would say, there's a new phrase in marketing called, it's going to sound crazy, but it's leaky newsletters, which just means that if you put a lot of links to other people and other sites, then you're actually kind of losing the attention of the people who are signed up for your mailing list. So the best thing you can do is to have very few links and most of them coming back to your work. So kind of keep that in mind is that when you're thinking about a newsletter, what's the purpose? And the purpose is to bring people back to your website. And of course, you need new content to bring people back to your website. Anytime that you're doing an event, uh, whether in person or online, make sure that you have the link to your website. Obviously, you can see mine is on my slides. So people can come to your website uh, and get the information that they're interested in. Because if you've gone to the effort of talking to them and you know, being with them on an event, whether in person or in Zoom, you want to make sure that you connect that, connect that, um, that you know, the, the relationship. So invite people back to your website. Again, if you do any kind of ads anywhere, obviously always have people coming back to your website. Sometimes people will do ads and send people straight to a bookseller. That's great. But once they go to a bookseller site, if they're not interested in your book, they have all this other distraction, right? You're literally leading them to distractions. You're advertising and paying money so they can go to a book page that has your competition right on that same page. So it's not a great way for you to get uh, orders if you're going to be sending people just to that. So kind of keep in mind that if you're doing ads, it might be more beneficial for you to have people come to your website where they can uh, you know, follow you on social media and they can sign up for your mailing list and hopefully buy your book. And hopefully there's some way that you can monetize a relationship with them where they're willing to pay for your expertise. So that gives you a lot more, uh, a lot more opportunities to connect with people than if you're just sending them to a bookseller. So I'm not talking about Amazon ads for Amazon page, talking about ads on you know, Google or Facebook or something like that. So bringing people back to your website should be your goal. And then anytime I do publicity, we generally have you know, the link to a public, an author's website right in our bio. So people who are interested in a podcast they've done or re read the review of the book or whatever it is, that they come back to the website because that piece is actually a little bit more tangible than sales. You know, none of us control sales. We can't control how many people buy our books. Most book publishers don't know, agents don't know, best selling authors don't know. But the thing that you can control is all of this way to bring people to your website and you can actually monitor the website traffic on, you know, on with uh, Google and, and analytics or other platforms that can help you see the traffic on your website. So you can see that it's working. And in the long run, having all of these things in place will really make such an important difference to your career long term. 
um, not just for one book or two books or something, but really as an author on a not on a long time basis on the long term basis. So those are the three things that I want you to think about is if you can figure out a way to build your own website, and then that's just me and my website. If you can figure out a way to wow, my hair is so much longer now. <laughs> anyway, um, find a platform that you like and that you can build your own website, that would be great. The second thing is that you want to make sure that you are creating enough new content on your website that people will come to your website for that reason. And then the third reason is you want to drive people, actively drive people to your website. So if you have new content, sending people to your website is going to be a really important thing. And I think if you think of any activity that you do, the purpose being getting people to your website, you will see that it kind of creates a little cohesion in your marketing that may right now feel very scattered. So you're doing a little bit of this and a little bit of this and a little bit of this, but if you sort of create the website as the center of all of your marketing, you will feel that cohesion in your marketing. Um, so that's, that's me. I will answer any Q and A's you guys have. I do want to tell you a little plug for my own platform. It's called uh, PubSite. Uh, it's a do-it-yourself platform for author websites, and it's made just for authors. So it's not event planners and photographers and things like that. I will send um, the, I can send the link in the chat as well. So that way you can, uh, if you're interested, you can look into it. So um, I think I'd really like to see you all and open it up to your questions. So if you have um, questions, let's, Let's stop sharing the screen and let's have a little dialogue. And I'd love to be able to answer your questions. So just uh, unmute if you wanna come back in and chat with Fauzia. Remember we're, we're recording, so this is for posterity. We're happy to keep the question and answers on the recording. Uh, and there are a few in the chat too. So I'll let you work your way through uh, live questions and then I'll ask those if they don't, if they don't get asked. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. So if you're if you are here and you have a question to ask, um, please go ahead and unmute yourself and ask away. Okay, I'll, I'll ask. Um, I <clears throat> I'm an author, but I'm also a research librarian, and I can research anything really. Um, so how how would I monetize that? I mean, would I because re real research takes a lot of time. Um, do I charge by the, I don't know, quarter hour, hour? What, what, how do you do that? I think, I mean, that's something that you can think about in terms of, you know, providing an expertise. So my idea always, even when I'm providing the power hour to authors, is that spending one hour with me will probably save them loads of hours and research and, you know, going down the internet rabbit hole and, you know, feeling overwhelmed and confused and all of that. So that's really what you're offering them too. You know, you're offering them a way to save their time and they can come to you and maybe give you a, a, an assignment and you can have it where you can either do it month, like a per hour charge, or you can do it on a per project charge, but, you know, like if somebody is trying to do, let's say, research on Irish genealogy for their new novel, and if you can give them shorthand on something, right, you've done all the research and you give them something, that would be hugely valuable for someone who doesn't want to take the time or doesn't have the, the skills. I don't certainly have the skills you do. So trying to figure out, and again, some of this monetizing piece is really kind of thinking about it in, in new ways. I had one author who's a doctor and we talked about it and he was like, well, everybody's always asking to pick my brain, right? I mean, how many times has that happened? That happens to me all the time. And this way he was able to actually put it as, if you need a second opinion, you know, I don't have to be a doctor, but if you wanna pick my brain, here's an hour call that you can have with me. So just think about that in some ways, or is there research that you already have, or is there something that, you can give someone direction so they're actually not wasting a lot of time. Some, some authors are really great editors, so they're offering that. And you know, some of my clients are offering classes on how to get an agent. And 
So I think there's a lot of different things. You just have to think about your own sort of expertise and what you can do. Well, quick one follow-up question. Um, I know some, some really, really excellent sites. Would I want to put up a page of, of links on my website for that? So that is a really, really good question. I do want to address that because that, as a librarian, your go-to is to provide resources, right? Like that's what you want to do is you want to help people, you want to share resources. But the thing is that that air, that piece that I talked about, which is the leaky uh, website and a leaky newsletter, it's like you've worked so hard to get people to your website. As soon as they land, you're sending them off somewhere else from which they may never come back. So I would say that if you have a great resource list, put it something that if people sign up for your mailing list, they get it in an email. Right, so it, gives, it gives people a reason to get some really good valuable information, but you're also not redirecting them as soon as they come to your website. Thank you. You're welcome. So lovely to hear from you. Yeah, that's a good, those are great questions and wonderful yeah. answers. A, a follow on and Fauci, I don't know if you agree with this. You can set, if someone's going to click from your website, you can set it so that it doesn't, they don't leave your website. It opens in another tab or it opens in another window. So you, if you select to open in another tab, then it will open uh, aside your website and probably not close your website. So that might be, that's good as well. And that's definitely a great idea. And it's good when you're doing bookseller links. I believe that's the best way to use bookseller links. But if you have a lot of links, sending people off to other places, even if you have two windows open, people will go in that other direction. So, you know, you want to try to keep, it's so hard to get people to your website and they only spend 30 seconds on your website. So you've got to really make a decision on what do you want them to do in that 30 seconds? Do you really want them to look at resources that are not yours? Great. So there, I did gather a few from... Uh, from the chat. So I'll awesome. go ahead. And Thank you. you. Um, so Mickey has asked, and I'll go, I'll do this one first because it's something that you mentioned. When you mention monetize, do you recommend affiliate links to book retailer retailers? Yeah, there's no reason not to do that. I mean, as as some of my friends have said, you know, it's it gets you cat food for the month or something like that. So it's not like it's going to make you rich, but there's no harm in doing it. In fact, I think that one of the things that I'm not thrilled about is that publishers, big, big publishers, when they have link, bookseller links on their website, they get a referral fee for them, selves. So they're selling your book already and then they make the referral fee back. So that's just, I think authors should have their own website with their own referral links. links. So whatever it is, uh, it's actually getting you some, you know, some money. Yeah, and I think I think where um, where someone uh, like Fauzia with her experience and um, and technique will come in is that there are, there are probably legalities that go with affiliates. You have to post certain wording on your website to let people know that if they if they click those links, something's going to happen. Um, and Fauzia would I'm sure have all of those uh, all of that knowledge to help you, help readers with. Writers. Yeah, I don't think you need to worry about if you're sending people, let's say, to a bookshop, right? Bookshop has affiliate links. If you're sending people there, the link is already embedded in, like, you get the code is in the link itself, so you don't need to do anything separate. I think the only time when you really want to be upfront with people is if you're promoting a product or promoting something because you're getting paid to promote it and not disclose that. I think that's, that is where you get tricky. But I think if you're sending people to a bookseller to buy your book, the link is already, the link they give you once you've become an affiliate member has all of that built in. So it's not like you have to give them, ex it, people wouldn't even know that. Good, yep, that's that's great information as well. Yeah. Um, and and good for us all to, to hear because that, because it is, it's a little bit confusing with, with how to link things and what that means. Yes. Um, Franklin, hang on just a second. I, if you have a question, I'm gonna go to, uh, so Crystal asked earlier, also in, in response to something you said, why don't you like WordPress? <laughs> so, you know, WordPress is the granddaddy of websites, right? If you like it, more power to you. It's fantastic. It's a robust site. It does all sorts of good things. My confusion with websites is that I have another job, 
that I like a lot. And I do, I work on that. So every time I needed to go make a change on, on WordPress, I had to rethink about like, oh, how do I use this? And even simple things like changing the menu on WordPress was just so hard. And so I just found it very cumbersome to use for myself. I know a lot of people share that frustration with, uh, with WordPress, but it is, as I said, the granddaddy of WordPress, you know, it's of web development. So if somebody's good at it and they like it, all good. Use whichever one you like. I just found personally found it a little bit stressful because every time I went, there was like all these security updates and you know all that kind of stuff, and you're like, ah. So um, it was not my favorite. It it is intimidating. <clears throat> um, okay, so Bill, I see your question. I'm going to hold it for just a second, and Frank. Franklin, hang on just a second. So uh, Sterling asked it about my comment. Um, the question is, one of the participants mentioned before the recording began that even authors who haven't published yet should have a website. Why is that? And what kind of content would you post? Yes, so I believe that too. It's one of the bullets in my description of the, of the presentation is that I do believe that authors need a website. I'd say as soon as you have an idea for the book, you should have a website because it gives you a chance to kind of play out the ideas. I'll give you a good example. I had this one author and he wanted to write, it's a nonfiction book, but he was writing a book and he had this idea and he was like, people need this information. It's critical information. People care about this information. So I said, why don't we set up a website and you post about this topic and let's see what the reaction is right? So he posted some content about this web, uh, about this topic. And honestly, it was crickets, like people were just not responding at all. And in some ways that gave us the market research, not to spend the next three years working on a book that maybe nobody wants. So a new book, a new website, if you're working on a book, it's a good way to get people involved. It's a good way to blog about it, blog about the journey. You know, we've been talking about research, and mystery authors have to do a lot of research. I know that. So do the re talk about the research you've done. Talk about the issues with book jackets or the title of the book or whether you're thinking of writing under pseudonym or not. All of the things that you're going through as an author, other people are going through too, and it helps you build community. So by the time your book comes out, you actually have built a community around your book. Yeah, that's great. So, so we, we have had um, some meetings in the past where we've talked about social media and so many of my writer friends say, you know, I get more likes and more comments when I post pictures of my cat. That's right. Than I do when I talk about the book. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, the pictures of the cat, I think, keep the people coming back and then they're going to see the post about the book because uh, they're looking for those pictures of the cute kitties. Um, so I have, I do. So Bill has a question. Franklin, did you want to ask, do you have a question that you want to ask? Can you, and there you go. Yeah. I was just wondering if, um, if you have any examples of websites that are working really well, um, I have a website, but you know I'm I'm in that category of not looking at it for years on end. Um, so maybe an example of, of what would look like. That's actually a great uh, great. It goes with Bill Gormley's question. He asked, do, "Does Fauzia have any favorite websites for mystery writers in particular?" So that these tie in nicely together. Thanks, Franklin. It's like I paid him to be my uh, my straight man here. Yes, I maybe I will find one, but I do want to actually go back to the cat photos because it's kind of an important uh, question. So I remember one time, I don't, I mean, you guys are all mystery writers and in Northern California, so you know Sue Grafton and one of the sort of bright, uh, bright moments of my career is that we built Sue Grafton's first website and it was the first ever website for an author. Like there was, it was 97. And so it was quite an honor for us to build the, you know, New York Times number one author website. New York Times covered it as like something authors do now, building websites. It was like a huge thing and it was such an honor. And we've, we've updated it five times since then. But what, the reason I bring it up is because I remember one time she was going on tour for her new book and she was adamant that there was all these kitten phot photos that she wanted to put on her website. And that was before FaceTime, Facebook maybe? I, I don't know. Maybe it was there. But anyway, she was adamant to get the kitten photos on. 
And she was like, oh no, I have to have them up on the website because when people come to my book signing, they'll ask about my kittens. So I've got to give them an update. So if you are getting likes on your kitten photos, put them on your website. Have people come to your website for them. Let them get the journey of the kittens on your website. Yes, you can post one of the photos as clickbait on social media, but then bring them back to your website because once they're on your website, they might look at, you know, a web, you know, they might look at uh, other options on your website, like your book and things like that. So, so I, you know, obviously um, websites are subjective too. My feeling is always that a website should be something that is really useful and easy to navigate for the readers. Like that's the goal for a website. And so when we designed PubSite as a platform, um, and we had Tom Clancy's website on our on previously, and we moved his website to our platform, and we moved, you know, uh, uh, Robert B. Parker's website and other mystery authors' big websites on the on our platform. The important thing then was to make sure that they are easy to navigate and that they are very well organized because uh, uh, you know they have hundreds of books. I don't even know how many books they have now. These authors have so many, many, many books. So I think just making sure that the websites are easy to navigate and easy to come together and where you can reach the, get the information you need quickly, I think that's really important. As far as design and aesthetics, honestly, that's something that you can play with and you can design it the way you want to. But just remember that the information needs to be updated, People need a reason to come to your website and it should be well organized. Yep, so, of course, I would say, you know, Robert P. Parker, because we did it, and Sue Grafton, because we did it, and Tom Clancy, because we did it. So, but there's lots of good websites. I think it's more important to find a platform that you can use yourself. That is really important because if you do use it yourself, you can make changes and updates and you know, enjoy using it as part of your career rather than this brochure on the side. Yeah, that's that's also great. And and Fauci can can help uh, people find what's right for them. I think sometimes having a conversation uh, is easier than using going to the World Wide Web. Uh, that's just too vast. Um, I would also suggest that if any of you, you're most of the people here are members of, of Mystery Writers of America, if not our own NorCal chapter, if you go to the NorCal website and probably any of the chapter, MWA chapter websites, there's probably going to be a members page. Anybody with a website probably has a hyperlink. So if you want to see the websites of your friends, uh, go to that uh, page on the MWA NorCal site and just start clicking around. Um, if Even if you are going to you know, go to Fauci and, and tell her that you need help. Uh, it's great to also, I would, would imagine Fauci to come in with some idea of what you want it to look like, what you feel comfortable with. Yeah, you definitely do. So I'm putting the pub site link in the chat just so you guys can see it and they can, you can actually explore websites that are done on pub site. So the thing we did with pub site, so John, my husband and I are founders of pub site. And we both collectively have many years of experience in marketing and you know, publicity of books and sales of books. He was in sales, I was in marketing. We met in John Wiley, it's a book, book uh, publishing love story. <laughs> <laughs> and then we've been supporting authors ever since. So we, you know, and we've been doing WordPress sites, we've done custom build sites, all sorts of sites and we've done websites for big, big authors. But what we realized is that there wasn't a platform that was built just for authors. So, you know, when you have the Wix or the Squarespace sites, they are made for really entrepreneurs and businesses. And so you're trying to squeeze your book business into those platforms that are made for other platforms or other businesses. With PubSite, every decision we made is for books. So you don't need, obviously don't need any design skills. You have templates that are made just for books. Then you have, basically you're filling in the forms. So if you can fill in forms and you can make, you know, your Christmas cards uh, like we all do now, you can actually build a website. So you don't really need a lot of help that way. So just pick the platform that works for you. There's a lot of different ones and they all give you a free trial. We give a 14 day free trial. Wix does, Squarespace does. 
fool around with it if you're comfortable, enjoy it, keep it. If you're not, find another one. That's great. Does anyone else want to pop in and, um, and say hi and ask any questions? Speaking of cat videos, you have the scariest cat behind you with a cape on. This is Matilda. Are you crazy? She's, she comes every Halloween. Oh, <laughs> I love it. A, she's a rat, actually. She's just a big, she's a big rat. Okay. Oh, that's very cute. My dancing Matilda. Um, yeah, so, so. Um, I did, I actually wanted to ask a question, okay, Fazio, yeah. about um, how uh, is Linktree worth investigating in terms of driving traffic from your Instagram, your blog? Uh, is that worth pursuing? Linktree? Yeah, so, so a lot of times people will do that because, you know, they want, they've, they've put, especially on like a uh, Instagram where they right. don't allow you to have a link and you've been talking about something, it gives you direct link to places. So I think depends on your content strategy. It's maybe worthwhile if you have a lot of things. So sometimes I think it's really helpful when people are getting, um, I see it when, you know, those, the influencers that have um, an Amazon store for themselves, right? They get commission mm. on having content there, they post videos, whatever, something like that, or they're selling something else somewhere else those kinds of things where they're literally directing you on how to spend money with these people, it might be worthwhile. I don't know if it's worthwhile for an author. I believe that all of that content should be well organized and live on your website. Ah, okay. All you do is you send people back to your website because the thing is maybe they do, maybe you can do a link tree and have a link to directly to Amazon, right? But that's my, my issue when I said about ads too. Linked tree is basically like you're curating the information about you and saying, here's where I think you should go. So you send people directly to Amazon, they get to your Amazon page and right underneath your book or, you know, underneath the description, there are like five other books that are competing, right? right? right. You're right, literally right. directing people to your competition. You're like, right. here, and then people go off and they go, oh, I do need those socks. I think I'm going to go buy the socks and they're gone. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. If you've yeah. got their attention, your priority should be to bring them to your website so they can sign up for your mailing list. Great, right? yeah. That's yeah. the goal. Um, and I think that's probably a better way to do it. But you can certainly explore it, see if that works for you. But I think it works more for people who are really going to make money off of all of those different links. Right, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things I had I haven't talked enough about, and I'm happy to do that now. One is that why a website is important for media. Also, um, a lot of authors don't realize how much their website impacts the media that we can get for them in, as publicists. So, if a website looks dated, the media isn't covering it. Believe it or not, you know it has nothing to do with how good your book is. It's all about the perception. So you want to make sure, and again, that's true across the board, whether you're early on in your career and you're trying to get an agent's attention and the agent is trying to get your publisher's attention and the publisher is trying to get the media attention, any of those things, the website needs to be up to date. It needs, you know, the design is really subjective and I don't think anybody worries about, oh, I didn't like the, the white space on that site. Nobody says that. But if your site is not mobile friendly, if your site is not organized, or it has one of those, for me, dreaded three columns of like content that I can't, do, I don't even know where my eye should go, um, or even two columns of content. That's just a lot of things to kind of keep, keep track of. Uh, and if you have blogs and things on your content that is literally seven years old, five years old, that's just not going to work for all of those people. So the first thing you want to do is make sure that your website is up to date and that you can use it and organize it the way you want. One of the things that uh, when I switched to PubSite from WordPress, where I complained uh, because I would want to change the menu and on WordPress, it literally meant redesigning the header, reprogramming it and all that. On PubSite, I can literally just drag and drop and change the, the menu anytime I want. 
simple things like that or an event that I have, uh, you know, if I'm doing an event, it's on my website. So you can see it's so much easier to, uh, you know, add an event uh, as opposed to on WordPress where I have to do cut and paste and move it down to recent as, as opposed to upcoming. All of those kinds of things just made it, it, it's just little things, but it just added up to frustration. So you want to make sure that your website is up to date and current. How many times have we gone to a website and literally the tour is from two years ago and it's on their homepage? We've suddenly seen that. So those are the kinds of things that actually will prevent you from getting good media attention as well. That's great information. We actually had a couple of other questions come in. Nancy, I see that you uh, unmuted yourself, but I'll go ahead and ask your question. You posted it as well. Should my MailChimp newsletter, which my website manager helps me organize, Good. be put on my website? If so, when to delete older ones? Same question about events. How soon to delete? Yeah, so I generally, with events, I generally keep events from last year because, gen, you know, one year, just so you can, people can see that you've been active and that you're out there and doing things and stuff like that. But I don't think anything past one year is relevant or interesting or anything like that. You can also be selective and only keep the ones that you're really proud of. So you don't have to keep all of them. I do think putting your newsletter on your website is a great idea. First of all, it ticks all the boxes, right? It's organized because people know what they're looking at. Uh, it's new content. So that way you have some reason to direct people to it. People see it and they like it, they can sign up for your mailing list. So I think all of those things are really important. As far as how dated it should be, honestly, I would say one or two years at most. Um, and you want to make sure that everything is updated because no, I mean, even two years, are any of us, do any of us have time to look at a newsletter from two years ago? I don't even have time to look at my own newsletter from yesterday. Like none of us have time for that. So just kind of keep that in mind is that people are coming to your website for 30 seconds. What do you want them to do? You know, you're, you're the curator, you're the, you're the director. Uh, right. It's in your hands to direct people to where they need to go. Curator is a good, a good uh, word for that too. Yeah. yeah. And most authors don't see that as their responsibility at all. They just put everything up there and they're like, people will figure out what they want to read. Right. Like right. everything is on there, but that's not the, that's not uh, the right way to think about it. Okay. So we have another, a few more questions. Um, okay. Margaret Luck, Peggy, I saw that you had actually unmuted at some point too. If you want to come on, that's great. We remember we're all still recording. Um, so Peggy asks, if you already have a website on one platform, how easy it is to transfer that domain name to a different platform? Oh, that's okay. pretty easy. Um, that's not a problem at all. So when I um, moved my website from WordPress to PubSite, my bigger question was actually, can I keep my blogs? Because I've been blogging on WordPress for you know a decade and I didn't wanna lose my blogs. Um, although I took them down and I'm refreshing them to put them back up, but I didn't want to lose them, obviously, when I switched the domain name. So on PubSite, you can actually ex uh, import all of the blogs from WordPress so you don't lose them. But I do think that you don't put them all up. You should update them. And then what, domain name is really interesting. I think the way to think about it is that it is a good idea to keep your domain name separate from your website platform. So whoever does your website, if you're getting it done or whether you do it yourself, and I'm big advocate of doing it yourself. I know it's a pain, but once you learn it, you will love it and you'll feel empowered. So I hope you'll try it. Um, the WordPress, uh, basically the domain name just points to, this is a little bit of a technical term, but the IP address. So then all you're doing is pointing it to a new IP address. And so it's not that difficult at all. You just, I mean, anyone would be able to help you. GoDaddy would be able to help you, Network Solutions, wherever your website is hosted. I mean, your domain name is hosted, uh, can help you with that. When, if people move to PubSite, we help them with the pointing. Uh, so I don't say transfer because transfer sounds more complicated. It's really just pointing to a new domain name. So you're basically saying, here's my URL. It used to point to this website. I'd like it to point to this website, and that's that's it. As simple as possible. That is that. It always sounds simple, doesn't it? 
you know, it sounds complicated. When I when you say something like transferring domain name through the IP address, it's like, oh my God, what on earth are you talking about? Like, I'll just I, give up now. I give that, up. I give. Yeah. So we have uh, Sterling asked, hi, John. Sterling asked, uh, on average, what's the cost of launching a website and the monthly cost of maintaining it? Yeah. So I have to tell you the story. Ages ago, when websites were still new, I knew of a publisher, small publisher. I think they had 10 books. It was a new publisher. They were a small publisher who had spent, I kid you not, $100,000 on a website. Crazy. And routinely, authors have spent upwards of ten dollars to $20,000 on websites. Please don't do that. You don't need to do that at all, especially now. There are still uh, people out there who are designing websites for four, five, six thousand dollars $6,000. The thing is that that's fine because they're good designers and all of those kinds of things. No, nothing, no shade on that. But if, if you can't update your website, then you're back to that whole solution of like, basically it's a show pony that you can't even touch. Um, you need something that you can ma maintain and update yourself. So whatever the platform is nowadays, you know, the platforms don't cost much. PubSite is $20 a month uh, most, and it's a do it yourself. So you can actually do it yourself for free and then it's just $20 a month. Um, and so there's a lot of other platforms that are, you know, even less, but they don't give you all the features and all that. I think you just explore your options. But one thing I would just say is that, you know, you just learn the platform, really. Pick one that you like or pick, ex ex you know, explore your options. It is something you will need in your life. Um, and so it's good if you learn it. And whichever one you like is great. And then those are all like basically free to set up. And then there's a monthly fee. So uh, it's not as expensive as it used to be. Yeah. So, um, you, Mikhail, you you uh, posted a comment. You said that the Authors Guild also hosts member domain names and doesn't cost much. That's that's great. Thank you. Yes, um, they actually Mikhail. have a website platform as well. Um, so you can definitely set up websites through them for sure. Great. That's good. Great information. And Mickey asked, does PubSite have e-commerce options? It does actually have e-commerce built in. So it's for that same flat fee. So if people want to sell their own book or, you know, sell signed editions of their books or something like that, they can actually do set that up. So we could we could actually pay uh, the monthly fee for PubSite if we could just figure out how to turn off two of those online streaming services. That right, exactly. The pandemic that now we can't log into anymore. Uh, that would be that would be great. Yeah. That is okay, true. so I think, does anyone else have any questions? We're recording. I'm going to stop the recording unless anyone wants to pop in and ask a question to Fautzia for posterity. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording. Okay, thank you.